That's what I want to talk about today. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to begin there because that's where our text takes us. And I want to be true to our text. And I want to acknowledge what's there. But we're going to spend very little time there, actually. But if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 7, 12, we're going to be there just for a moment. And from that, we're going to draw out a principle that's going to help us for Father's Day. I want to read the passage. You can follow along. It's verses 12 through 24. And it basically is, is a marriage advice for mixed marriages. What's a mixed marriage to Paul? It's a marriage where one of the couples is a Christian and the other couple is not a Christian. It might have happened because after they were married, one became saved. That might have well happened in Corinth that way. Or it might be because one who is a Christian married a non-Christian and now finds himself in a situation where they are asking the question of Paul, are the Corinthians, what should we do about this? Should we get divorced? And so Paul writes this in 7.12, But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. We're going to talk about that in a minute, see what that means. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her unbelieving, through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Interesting verse. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you might save your wife? Only as the Lord has assigned to each one as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He's not to become uncircumcised. Has any man called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Nothing important, that is. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. That's an important principle. Were you not called while a slave? Were you called while a slave? Then don't worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, do that. For he was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. So the principle here is pretty, uh, pretty easy, I think. Remain as you were. If you were married, remain married. If you were single, I suggest you remain single, unless the Lord calls you otherwise. If you're married to a non-Christian Christian, stay as you are. If you're in a slave, stay as you are. If you're a workman, stay as you are. If you're a son, stay as you are. Don't leave the family. In other words, continue until God calls you otherwise to what you are. We see that actually three times in the passage. I want to notice in verse 17, it says, As God has called each, in this manner let him walk. In other words, stay as you are. And then we see in verse 20, Each man must remain in the condition in which he was called. And then we see it re reaffirmed a third time in verse 24. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. It's pretty clear that God wants us to assess our situation as we are in life, in marriage and in jobs and we're in the status we are, and unless God calls us otherwise, to remain and to be good and steadfast in that situation. Now, a couple other things I want to draw from this passage, then I want to show you the greater principle that I want to take to our Father's Day message. First of all, just notice in verse 12, uh, but, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? So Paul is saying, I'm going to tell you something that the Lord didn't necessarily say. Clearly, Paul is not saying, I'm going contrary to the Lord's will. That doesn't make any sense at all. But what he's saying is that the Lord didn't teach everything while he was on the earth, every principle. He couldn't. But I, being a follower of God and being attuned to the Holy Spirit, in fact, being an apostle called to take his truth, know God's mind on this. And so although the Lord has not specifically spoken it while alive, I give you godly advice from the Father himself as to what to do in this situation. 
It's important we understand that, that Paul isn't all of a sudden going against Jesus. The other thing I want to just point out is verse 14. Very interesting verse. I, I, I can't leave it without saying something about that. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the believing wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Well, let me make clear what it's not saying, and that is that if one is a Christian, it doesn't make the other a Christian. And how do I know that for sure? Not only because the Scripture would teach that, but also it says in verse 16, how do you know, O wife, whether you might save your husband? How do you know, O husband, you might save your wife by staying in that relationship? In other words, he makes it clear that there is a salvation of one and a non-salvation of the other. So what is it to sanctify the unbelieving spouse? Well, sanctify, as we've said many times, means to set apart, to put God's special blessing upon in a spiritual way. And I believe when there is a mixed marriage, one of the husband or wife is a Christian and the other is not, that God in a special way puts his hand of blessing or sanctification on that family, and God is going to work through that family. He goes on to say in verse 16, don't give up. And he goes on to say also in verse 14, your children would be unclean where, where there be no, no uh, salvation in that family. But they are clean now. In other words, I have a special blessing upon that family. It's not that I'm going to save them necessarily because you're a Christian, but I believe God's going to work through that wife or that husband who's a Christian. I believe there's going to be influence there. So be strong. If you're the stronger of the two couple, couple, be strong in being a witness to your children and to your spouse. That's what, God, that's what Paul is saying. Stay as you are. Be steadfast in your calling. And that's the title of my message. Be steadfast in your calling. So I want to take that greater principle and I want to apply it to Father's Day. Fathers, be steadfast in the calling that God has given you as a father. You can't shirk that responsibility. In fact, mothers, the same would be true for you. Don't shirk your responsibility. In fact, if you're single... The same is true for you. Don't shirk that responsibility that you have very specially as a single person or as a young person. Whatever your calling is, be steadfast in that calling. I've been doing some study in the Psalms. I heard Jason say how special the Psalms have been to him recently. And I've particularly looked at places in the Psalms where it says, Blessed is the man who... Dot, dot, dot. And I've put together four principles that I want to share today as we're steadfast in our calling. Blessed is the one, and we know that when it says blessed is the man, that it means blessed is the person. I know he's talking about the man specifically, but it's talking about the woman, it's talking about the child, it's talking about the person. Blessed is the man. I want to give you four principles today. And the four principles are blessed is the man who delights in the Lord, blessed is the man who, whose strength is in the Lord, blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord. And blessed is the man whose fear is in the Lord. Do you have those four? That's what our outline is going to be today. What it is to delight, to find our strength in, to trust in, and to fear the Lord. Of all the Psalms, these are the compilation of what the psalmist said is blessed. And we know blessed means God's hand upon, happy is, fulfilled, meaningful, having a purpose in life. Blessed as opposed to being cursed, as opposed to not having God's blessing, not having His choice. It's an inner satisfaction. We all want that inner blessing of God. We all want that inner sense that we are called of God and we're doing the right thing. So how do we do that, says the psalmist? Blessed is the man or blessed is the one whose delight, whose strength, whose trust, whose fear is in the Lord. Now I want to illustrate each of those by a, an image that we're going to see. This is the image I want to show you for delight. Looks like a path you want to walk down, doesn't it? Now, there's a road we'd like to travel. There's one we'd like to hold our wife or our husband's hand or our friend's hand or our child's hand and just take a, a walk through this beautiful uh, autumn pathway. We don't see too much like that in Santa Barbara, I don't think. Blessed is the one whose delight is the Lord. I, I, I encourage you to take your Bibles, if you have them, and look at them. Psalm 1 is where I'm going to start. And Psalm 1 is one that's very familiar to us, where it says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who, who standeth not in the way of sinners. Blessed is the man who sitteth not in the way of the wicked. But his, here's the word, his delight, 
His delight, the blessed man's delight is what? In the law of the Lord. And in that law does he meditate day and night, continually. So I see three principles right here from this psalm about the blessing and about the delight. Number one, the, the man who is the godly man delights not in any of the influence of the world that is wrong. Stays away from the wrong images on the computers. Stays away from the, from the bars. Stays away from those who are telling coarse jokes. Just kind of doesn't hang around those that are going to be a poor influence. Now, we, we're in the world. We can't avoid all bad influence, of course. But as the man who chooses his path to be a delightful path as much as he can and chooses not to walk in the way of the evil. The second thing I notice from this passage is the man whose delight is in the law, not just in the Bible and the Scripture itself, but specifically in the law of the Lord. The law are those confining principles that God gives to protect us. The law is say, don't do this, don't do this, keep away from this, and blessed is the man whose delight is in the restrictions that God gives. Isn't that interesting? Blessed is the man who understands that a loving God has given loving restrictions that keep us focused and keep us on the right path. Or blessed is the man that goes, doesn't go down the, the stormy path or down the, the, uh, the scary path or down the windy path if you have a choice, but goes down the delightful path. The third thing I noticed from this, which I know you'll see, is blessed is the man who meditates upon this law day and night continually. It doesn't mean he's reading the Bible all the time, but it means he's constantly thinking about God's word God's law, God's provisions, and fathers, the best thing you can do for your children is to be a man of the word. I would say it to mothers, the best thing you can do is to be a woman of the word. The best thing you can do, singles and children, is to be a person of the word. Blessed is the person because their delight is in the word of God. Jason's already encouraged us today to read the word more. So does Psalm 1. So does the psalmist. But let's talk about delight a little bit more because delight implies also rejoicing. I love it in Philippians chapter 4 where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, in case you didn't get it the first time, rejoice. In other words, be a happy person. Be a delightful person. Enjoy that walk down the path. Don't walk down that path and talk about all the problems you have. <laughs> Don't walk through life and grouse. It also implies not only rejoicing, but it implies a thankful heart. Do you know that the command in the Bible that is most given to us? Well, I just gave you a hint. It's to be thankful. It's said more often in the Old and New Testament than any other command that God gives us. Did you get that? There's a good biblical trivia question. What is the command in the Bible that is most said and repeated? It is to be thankful. You probably have heard that uh, some people are grumbly hateful. But God wants us to be humbly grateful. Kind of a cute little turn of words, but it, it's true. He wants us to be humbly grateful more than understanding that life is full of all kinds of problems, all kinds of disappointments, all kinds of tragedy. No question. But God wants us to, well, we've heard the, we've heard the expression, you make uh, lemonade out of lemons, you know. He wants the Christian who's, who understands that there are some difficult turns in life. It's also the person who understands what, what King David was writing in Psalm 23 that we so love. He makes me walk in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. That reminds me of this kind of walk too, the beautiful walk, the walk where I delight in God and I delight in what He has given. We've already sung, you're a good, good father. You give and you give and you give and you give again. Yes, you do. A couple other things that the fathers particularly and all of us need to be thankful for. If you turn to Psalm, Psalm 16, there's a beautiful text there that I'd love you to see. Come on, flip those pages. You can do it. It's not on the screen today. Sorry. Can't be lazy. I guess you can be, but I encourage you not to be. Psalm 16, beginning in verse 6. I, I, I really appreciate this, this. Here's the psalmist. Understand David is running away from troubles. Understand David is living in caves at the moment. Understand there are arrows that are coming his way. But here he says, The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. 
Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. My mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. I delight. I rejoice. My flesh dwells securely. And David says, despite my circumstances, I am content. And yes, more than content, I am delighted. Not in my circumstance, I am delighted in what? In the Lord, who is with me, who loves me, who sustains me, who leads me in the good path, right in the middle. He even prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, said David in another psalm, in Psalm 23, remember. But isn't it true? We can certainly say it in Santa Barbara, haven't we? My lines have fallen in pleasant places. I have a pretty good place to live. But we can also say, I have have a pretty good family. I have a pretty wonderful situation. Oh, I know I have problems and I struggle with this and that and whatever. But it's the person who delights in the Lord and His provision. Let me give you one last one to think about as we think about delight. And I want us to turn to a very uh, special passage, and that is Psalm 127. Dads, don't miss this one. This one is definitely for dads. It's for moms too. But, But look at Psalm 127. And I want us to see where it says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Yes, they are like they are in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver, I love that, is full of them, using the arrow and the, and the arrows in a quiver. Blessed is the one who has children. Now, guys, dads, moms too, I understand that children can be a pain sometimes. I've had my share of that. And children can be a challenge all the time. Yes, children, you can. And yes, we were when we were young. But isn't it true that we are to have our delight in the Lord over our fatherhood, the fact that we have children? If you're blessed with children, whatever your circumstance, they are a gift. Do you see them as a gift? Do you see them as a blessing? That's how we're supposed to see them, says the psalmist. And we are to delight in the Lord. So let's just review in our word delight as we walk down this path. We're supposed to shun those things that will lead us the wrong way. Make choices, good choices. We're supposed to be glad for the restrictions that God gives us as we rejoice in the law. We're supposed to meditate on His Word continually, allowing the Word to refresh us and delight us in who He is. We're also to rejoice always. Again, I'm going to say it, rejoice. We're to be thankful above all things and grateful, humbly grateful. And we're to rejoice in our situation, our circumstance, whatever it is. Even Paul said, I've learned to be content in the most difficult of circumstances and delight in the Lord. And then lastly, we're, of course, to light as fathers in the gifts of children that God has given us. So delight in the Lord. This is is not always the path that you'll have, but we are to be to delight. I want to show you the second path that we want to look at today. This is a more rugged path. And sometimes our, our walk through life, dads, moms, others, is a little more challenging. It feels like it's uphill all the way. It feels like you have to take a step and watch your step all the way. That it would be difficult for a, for a mount, like a, a donkey or a, a, a horse, to make that. They could do it, but it would be difficult for them too. And you have to watch your way. And this is our strength is in the Lord. We need some strength to go up paths like this. We need some strength to go through walks that are more difficult in life. And every one of us are either going through one now, or we will soon, or we have been through them. You know that. So what does it mean that our strength is in the Lord? I take you to Psalm 84. If you're flipping, this is where it's found. There's a number of places where these words are found, by the way, not just one. But these are the primary ones. And I want to show you a a passage that really meant a lot to me this week as I was studying. And I shared part of this with my connection group this last Thursday night, so you're going to get a repeat on that connection. But I want you to look at Psalm 84, beginning in verse 5. How blessed is the man, again, talking a man, but apply that to you too, women, please. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, Lord. And then it goes on poetically to say this. In whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, and Baca means weeping. So passing through the places of weeping, they, that is the blessed man, make it a spring. The early rain covers it with blessings. 
They, that is the blessed man, go from strength to strength, and I would say as opposed to sorrow from sorrow. And then it finally finishes up in this little section saying, Every one of them, that is the blessed man, appears before God in Zion. Now let me break that down for us. I, I, it's all poetry. And I remind you that the first half of a psalm or a proverb and the second half of a psalm or a proverb help each other, help you to understand what the other half is about. Did you know that's true of Hebrew poetry? That Hebrew poetry is set out in a way where they're, they're, they, they complement each other. Part A, part B. So part A of verse 5 is how blessed is the man whose strength is in you. So how does the second half of verse 5 help define what it means that our strength is in God? How blessed is the man whose heart has the highway to Zion? Now Zion, yes I know is Jerusalem, but Zion always in Scripture refers to heaven, to that heavenly place beyond. Remember the old hymn, I'm marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. I'm, mar- I'm not marching to Jerusalem. I'm marching to heaven, you know, in the psalm. So Zion is, is the poetic way of saying uh, uh, heaven. And the blessed man whose strength is in the Lord is the one who has highways to heaven. In other words, constantly like travel going on a highway at 65 or more miles an hour is the prayer, is the thought, is the energy of the person whose strength is in the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful poetic thought? We who are strong in the Lord continually are going to heaven with our prayers, receiving from heaven his insights and his thoughts in our mind, and letting him know that we love him and that he loves us, and there's a continual traffic between the man whose strength is in the Lord and heaven. Don't you love that poetry? I don't see a lot of enthusiasm out there, but I hope you do. That's, that's what our strength is, that we are continually attached to like highways to heaven. Then look at verse 6. When this man whose strength is in the Lord or woman whose strength is in the Lord is passing through the valley of Baca, are you ever there? You ever go through times of weeping? Maybe not literally weeping, but of just sadness and sorrow and bummer? Of course, we all do. What is the person whose strength is the Lord does? He makes it a spring. He makes the weeping as if it's a spring. And he, yes, is going through the tears. Yes, is hurting, but he rejoices. I think of, of funerals where I, I often use the phrase that uh, the wise person, though they mourn, we mourn not as those who have no hope. There may be tears coming down the cheeks, but inside there's the rejoicing of the, of the Lord, the knowing that, that, person, that their loved one is with the Lord. That's in the time of Baca making it a spring. And then it goes on in the second half of that verse, the early rain covers it with blessing. This is kind of an early rain to a summer we're having today, you know. We're getting a little early rain blessing, and that's a good thing. The man whose strength is the Lord allows, this, this rain could be, oh, bummer, here it is, Father's Day, and there's rain. But rather, we say, it's a blessing. You see, it's perspective. Perspective's everything, right? And so, the man whose strength is the Lord sees the positive. And then look at verse 7. They, this person whose strength is the Lord, go from strength to strength. I think of the old movies, and you might think of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember where uh, he had to put his foot in this place? And if he put it in this place, he'd blow up. Then he had to put it in this place. Then he had to find the foot right You with me? Or There's all kinds of movies that you have to, like the minefields. You put your foot in a mine and you're gone. But if you know where the mines are, you just do it like... The, the man whose strength is the Lord goes from strength to strength rather than from sorrow to sorrow. What, what, what is the poetic, what's that saying? It's saying that rather than focus on the sorrows of life and saying, oh, I've had really a bummer day and oh, what a bum, this really happened to me today. Oh, my thumb is really hurting. You know, my leg is really bothering me. Doggone, my car went down today. They go from strength to strength. They go from joy to joy. They remember the good things and their remembrance of the past is not sour, they remember the good things, and they look forward to the good things. The man who strength of the Lord is a positive person and sees the positive in their family, sees the hope, sees things with hope and with uh, believing all things, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13. Love believes all things, hopes all things, trusts all things, you know, sees the positive. I love this. So be the person of strength. And if you will go on in this passage, which you don't have, don't have time to do, the man of strength is a man of prayer. A man of strength is a man of church, 
And the man of strength is a man of trust in the Lord's goodness. Read the rest of Psalm 84 if you have time, guys, and women as well. So strength, it takes some strength to get up that passage. Now I want you to look at trust. Here's a tougher pass. There are times that you, even with your, your best legs, you can't get up on your own. I, I dare anyone but Jason to get up there without help. Yeah, I know Jason could. You might have to even put some pins in the rock. Now, I think of one who's a little higher than that. But here's a person who has to trust. And they have to trust one another. And to be pulled up. And yeah, you can be pulled up. Blessed is the man who trusts in God. We saw that at the very end of Psalm 84, if you saw it. I didn't read it. But, but verse 12 says, How blessed is the man who trusts in you. But I want to take you to Psalm 40. It actually says the word trust many times in the Psalms. But let's look at Psalm 40. And just see the context there. I think we would agree that trust is earned over time. You don't automatically trust someone because you see them. And that trust can easily be broken. That happens with our spouses. It happens with our children. It happens with our pastors, our churches. It happens with our bosses. Trust can be broken because all of a sudden they let you down. They do something wrong. They lie. They cheat. And all of a sudden that trust is broken, but trust can be re-earned and regained over time as there is faithfulness. Now, why is God so easy to trust? Because He's 100% faithful. As was pointed out earlier, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies, new reasons to trust you do I see. As I look back on my life, I realize that you've been faithful, that you were there as the old uh, poem that we love so much sometimes, the footprints, you know, you carried me through those difficult times and I see the footprints of you carrying me. He's faithful continually and he's worthy of trust. It says in Psalm 40, verse 4, how blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust. I like that phrase, has made the Lord his trust. That's a choice. We trust in God and we trust in God to be the one who's not going to let us go. Can you, can you see how if you're walking up there, if you put your full weight on that hand and then take that step and if the person let go, the trouble you'd be in? You, can you visualize what that would be? There comes a point where we have to trust that that person is going to hold on and going to lift us up so we can get on top of that rock. That's the trust we can put in the Lord. The man who has chosen to always trust God, even when it seems like the path is extremely difficult. I want to take you back in Psalm 40 to see where that phrase comes from, verses 2 and 3. This reminds me of the path we're looking at here. He, God, brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. (laughs) That kind of reminds us of this picture, doesn't it? Making my footsteps firm all of a sudden again, because they weren't firm for a while. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord because I have put my trust in the Lord is the the implication. How blessed is the man who has put his trust in the Lord, who has made the Lord his trust. Just like we have to trust that chair when we sat down in it. Now, that wasn't very hard to trust that. You've never seen that chair fall down. Nobody has ever sat in one of our chairs and fallen down. But you had to. Put your, all of a sudden release your weight and put it in the chair. Even more specifically, when you leave today, you're going to get into a car that you have the foggiest idea how that car really runs or whether someone's let out the air or someone has pulled out the plugs and, and you're going to get it and go and you're going to trust that automobile to take you home and not run into a tree and the steering's, you know what I mean. You put trust in it. Blessed is the person who puts the trust in the Lord as absolutely as we put the trust in a chair or a car Or a computer. Now, computers and cars let us down occasionally. The Lord will never. I also want to mention the the basis of trust, the demand of trust, and the living out of trust. Then we're going to move on. What is the basis of trust? It is the fact that He has brought me out of the miry clay. He has put my feet upon a rock. The reason I trust God is because in your life, Christian, you have seen what God has done, haven't you? You realize what you've been saved from. You understand that you're not the person you would be were it not for God. Now, you're on a path. You're not perfect. But you are so much different than you would have been had you never trusted in Him. 
And therefore, be, the basis of our trust is that God has done exactly what He's promised and has never failed. What is the demand of trust? It is absolute, complete buy-in. All of us know I trust. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own insufficient understanding. I'm adding insufficient. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will be worthy of trust and will make your path straight and will bring you up off that rocky precipice and onto the top where you have solid footing. So the demand of trust is full buy-in, not partial. You don't try in on God like a pair of shoes. You don't trust Him like whether the coat will fit or not, and I'll return it uh, tomorrow if it doesn't. You take full buy-in and say, I fully trust you, God. You are my 100% hope, and I trust in you. So the basis of trust is our salvation, what He's done for us. The, the demand of trust is the full buy-in that He wants from us all the way. And the living out of trust is found in Romans 8.28. We all know that verse also, and you will when I say it. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. The living out of the trust is believing that however rocky the path is, that God's going to work it out for His good. Whatever circumstance you're in, wherever you find yourself, you just found out you've lost your home. You just found out your job is gone. You just found out that you have cancer. You just found out that your best, your best friend is, uh, has, has cheated on you. Whatever the circumstance is, God's going to work it out for good. That doesn't mean it is good, but He somehow through that is going to lead you in the correct paths. You can trust Him. You can trust that He'll be around the corner. You can trust that He'll be there past the problem and through the problem to help you through it. That's a great Great truth that the man of God trusts in the Lord. So we've talked about delight. We've talked about strength. We've talked about trust. But there's one more that is said more than any other word in the Psalms. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? I love that picture, by the way. Can you see what it is? It's a man who is in absolute awe of a sky that he can't control, of the lightning that could hit him or not hit him, but there's a power, there's an awesomeness, maybe in the storm, maybe in the wind, and in awe before God and with a hunched reverence to God, he fears the Lord. It's our fourth and final principle. I want to dwell on it just for a few minutes here with us. It says in Psalm 112.1, you can look at it or I'll read it for you. It says, How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. So there we go back to the delight in his commands. But who fears the Lord. It says it in about ten places in the Psalms alone. And it says it in the Proverbs a number of places. We know that to fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, uh, wise old Solomon said. So fearing is very important. Now, I think that, that my church upbringing, and perhaps yours, did, a, did me a bit of a disservice. In that, it taught me that to fear the Lord was primarily to reverence the Lord. I say it's a disservice, not because it's untrue. Of course, to fear God is to reverence Him, to respect Him, to bow down to Him, to honor Him, to exalt Him, to put Him first in everything. Understood. But I believe to fear the Lord is more than that. And I want to say it in a way that that might grate a little bit. I believe to understand the fear of the Lord is to understand that not only is God the great lover, but God is the great opposite. God is the great hater. That's almost a tough one to say, isn't it? But to fear the Lord is to understand that there are things that God hates. And it's not just the obvious immorality and you can name all kinds of yucky things. God hates lukewarmness. Do you remember the Revelation passage? It says, I'm going (coughs) to spit lukewarmness out of my mouth. God hates fence sitting. God hates compromise. God hates slothfulness. God hates laziness. God hates drifting. 
God hates Bibles that sit on the shelf for weeks and months and years and lifetimes at a time. God hates people who never would darken the doorstep of the church and who joke about the fact that they would say, oh, the roof would fall in. God hates that. Now, God doesn't hate the person. We understand that. I hope we understand that. But God hates the attitude that says, God, you're not first in my life. Anything that is not putting God first is idolatry. So God is not the great lover, and we love the fact that God is our lover. But he's also the great hater. And I just want to, to mention a couple things. To fear God is to understand that, his discipli- that he disciplines those who loves us, as well as punishes those who disobey. To fear God is to understand that in order to conform us to the image of his Son, we must be purified in the fire of pain. That's a scary thought. To fear God is to understand that He has never promised to keep us from distress, disaster, and disappointment, but that His promise is to strengthen, guide, and refine us through those disappointments and disasters and struggles. To fear God is to understand what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, whether good or bad. That's to fear God. What I do in this life counts. Fathers, the way that I father my children is going to be remembered at the judgment seat, either for good or for bad. The way that I loved my wife, the way that I was a faithful employee, the way that I was active in my community, the way that I was active in my church, the way that I composed myself as a man of integrity. And women, same thing as a godly woman. That counts. That's the fear of God, to realize that like a loving father that you grew up with, he also had the paddle or the spank or whatever it was that he disciplined with. He had the right and and the responsibility to hold you accountable. I was a little afraid of my dad growing up. I loved him. He was a loving guy. I hope your dad was too. But there was a sense in which I feared him in the right sense of knowing that he had the ability to keep me in line. So does our Heavenly Father. So do you have the four? Father, that's my Father's Day message. Let's just review. Here's the review. Blessed is the one, and I say one because it's for men, it's for women, it's for children, it's for fathers, but for all of us, who delight along the pleasant paths. That's maybe the easier one, but sometimes not. Do we really rejoice when we're supposed to rejoice to strength along difficult paths, to trust along precarious paths and to fear along conforming paths when he's conforming us to the image of Christ through the fire, through the difficult times of life. Blessed is the one whose strength and whose fear and whose trust and whose delight is in the Lord. I hope that ministers to you. It did to me and the psalmist gave us those words. So that's my Father's Day message to us. And we have a Father's Day song to sing here too. Team, if you'll come up as I close this in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are our Father. And we remember as we finish that Jesus taught us to pray a prayer to our Father. And I encourage us, whatever version we say, trespasses or otherwise, that we say it together now, the prayer that you taught us to pray to our Father. Let's pray it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses or debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, some say. Amen. A lot of different versions we learned, but that's the prayer to our Father, our Father who art in heaven. He's the great I Am. That's another one of His names the ever-present one. Let's stand and let's sing that as we close our Father's Day service together. And let's resolve, each of us, to delight.